Welcome to another episode of Uncovering Possibilities. I'm here with another wonderful guest. This is my amazing sister, Ngozi and Ukazu. It's nice to see you. We're here in your studio. Yeah. Uh-huh. So thank you so much for like letting us do this in your home. I am so happy to be here and I can't wait to get into it. Well, let's start with your background. Tell us, tell us about like how you grew up and kind of your formative years and we'll go from there. Yeah. Um, well, you know all this. <laughs> It'll be funny if do I was I? like, this is the first time we've ever met. <laughs> Even though I've known you in your entire life. We're meeting a person. Yeah, yeah, my background, I think my professional background really starts in college. I went to Yale for undergrad and I actually thought I was going to major in computer science. Right. Um, yeah, it's that thing of when you're like first generation Nigerian, you kind of have this limited number of things that you might, your parents are... Uh, your family expects you to be a lawyer, like engineer, pharmacist. So I went into Yale thinking I'd be a computer scientist, but I always loved drawing and I always loved art. So my sophomore year, I had this huge crisis where I was not at all enjoying my computer science classes. So my dean was like, you should take art classes. And I reacted so poorly. I was like, I can't do that. That's not a secure career path. But with his encouragement, I ended up doing that. Wow. Um, I graduated and went to the Savannah College of Art and Design, where I decided, decided to major in sequential art, which, yes, you can major in comic books um, <laughs> in, for, in, in school. That's what I got my Master's of Fine Art in. And while I was doing that, I started my webcomic. I started a webcomic called Check, Please which is a story of a little gay kid from Madison, Georgia, who goes to play hockey in Massachusetts. It's a story of friendship and he bakes a lot of pies and it's a lot of college hockey. And I worked on that all through grad school and then eventually was able to self-publish. A publisher found out about that comic. And yeah, that's, that's kind of when it, I, I would call myself an official comic book artist then when that book started hitting shelves. And since then, yeah, that's what I've been doing full time. That, that is an amazing story because there's so many different sort of points, so many junctures in that story where it's like, it could have gone a completely, it could have flipped another oh, way. Oh yeah, entirely. I was like applying to animation studios mm -hmm. right out of college, like Disney, DreamWorks, Blue Sky. Like, uh, I thought that, you know, I wanted to get an MFA in case I wanted to teach. Right. There were a lot of different avenues, but I kind of like plinkoed my way into just doing web comics and then eventually publishing. I want to kind of dive into this, into the Yale comp sci to arts yeah. <laughs> part of your life. I know that was your second year and you said you need, needed kind of a little push. And it's great to have those people in our lives that can kind of empower us, encourage us to move that direction but i know for a fact i know for a fact that there was some like internal real struggle like what was the thing that you were like you know what i am gonna make the jump i'm gonna go into something that is a that is that is very much it's way less secure than going into computers or doing that yeah becoming a software developer mm -hmm. or, or a project manager. absolutely well so my dean dean farley uh dean of like U.S. history studies. Wow. Uh, he not really an arts guy. Definitely not a comp sci guy. He just knew about my art. He had like somehow found my Tumblr. I don't know. He was snooping. Okay. <laughs> but he was really encouraging about that. He clearly saw that I had some potential and said that you can do this. You can make a plan. I think my hesitation came from the fact that I didn't know about the steps that you can mm. take to have a, maybe a secure uh, career in the arts. Mm. And I think he was the person who encouraged me to research that, to investigate that, to mm. see people who were successful in the field that I wanted to go into. Right. So it's funny that you say it's taking a jump, like what pushed me to take a jump. It was more like he was encouraging me to take a step, mm. to like kind of feel things out so it didn't feel like a scary jump. Right, okay, that's cool. So who were the people that you maybe researched or came across in your research that a lot, like maybe just allowed you to, or gave you permission to explore that as a career? I, I think I first started with animation. Mm -hmm. I was looking at storyboard artists and people who are showrunners and just character designers. I was looking for all those things, but mm -hmm. I knew, cause I knew those were like 
you get a paycheck every two weeks and mm -hmm. you have benefits. So I started looking there mm -hmm. and that's really what I tailored my portfolio to. And my main goal in going to SCAD was to improve my draftsmanship so that I would be like undeniable to any uh, animation studio. Right. So I, I really started looking uh, at, at animators. But when I got to grad school, because I did major in graphic novels and comics, I started looking at anybody who seemed to be making a living making comics. So, I mean, and grad school, truly, they provide you with so many different artists and so many different writers that are successful in comics so that you start looking at their careers. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I also was looking at a lot of webcomic artists and seeing what they were doing. like. Yeah, N.D. Stevenson was a webcomic artist around the same time I was, and they seemed like they were doing very well. They went off to showrun, so I was like, okay, I'll apply for all the same grants that they do and try to get recognized by the same publications that they are being recognized by. So it was a lot of like really looking over people's shoulders, seeing if I could copy their test a little bit right. to see what they could do, see what I could do. Let me, let me ask you about you majoring specifically in sequential art. What about that in particular, as opposed to animation, as opposed to any other of the other visual elements and visual art things you can go into? What what strikes your fancy? <laughs> what strikes? Yeah. To be honest, it wasn't a choice. It was really? what I was allowed to do. Mm. Comics has the lowest barrier to entry of almost any visual art form. Huh. With illustration, you need an art director to get you published in the magazine. With animation, you need a studio. With comics, all you need is a piece of paper and hopefully a web connection, and then you're a comic book artist. So it's like you have, you can control the elements. You can control the story, you can control the characters, you can control how you, when you release, what you release. Like, is, is that is that maybe what you're yeah. what I'm getting at? Yes, those all those things are all true. But literally, just the ability to get your story to an audience is the mm. lowest barrier of entry. Like anybody can make a comic. Like you could start posting to your Instagram every day a comic that you make, mm -hmm. and you're a comic book artist. Right. No one, no one can stop you. No one, there's no gatekeeping to, right. to being able to make a comic. So with animation, it was a little bit more difficult. I already knew that I was a you know pretty good storyteller, but if I wasn't telling stories in the way that Disney wanted or Disney TV animation wanted, then I couldn't get in that door. With mm -hmm. comics, I could tell a story about hockey and pies and college and put that online and find an audience so again so again it wasn't really like i'm gonna do comics because i, I want to it's more like <laughs> right. this is the place where i could be as free and weird as i want mm. and people will somehow enjoy it and with comics especially online comics you can put anything online and hopefully you can find an audience there's so few barriers to entry and so when I started putting my comics online and I really wasn't hearing back from animation studios, it just seemed like the way to go. Okay, so finding an audience. That, now that's an interesting... That's the number one question I get from students. Right, because like, I, I think we could spend, a, and seriously, an entire hour on that. Why do you think your work resonates with so many people? And or enough people that you're able to make it, a pretty good living. Yeah, and my, and my facial expression and reaction to that wasn't like questioning that, I think that if anyone's making art prolifically and honestly, it will resonate with somebody. Mm -hmm. The problem is trying to find where it'll land, right? Mm -hmm. And like I said, it is the number one question I get from students. For me, I think I was able to find my audience quickly because I actually had like a pretty large runway for kind of gathering my audience. The first time I shared art online was when I was like 13. And I don't think our parents knew <laughs> what I was doing online. I was just putting weird drawings online and other 13 Can I ask what websites you were sharing? No, on? you may not. <laughs> what? Uh, no, it's like DVNR and then oh, eventually right. in high yeah. school, it was like Live Journal. Mm -hmm. I was just, I was, I would come home from middle school, mm -hmm. watch some anime, be like, wow, what? I wonder if other people are still thinking about this anime, even though it's like you turn off the TV. And I would go online, share my art, and see other 13, 14 year olds. I assume they were young. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, people, just like younger people who are like, yeah, I like this stuff too. And to this day, like I remember in high school, I do have a funny story about um, drawing so much fan art in high school that uh, Yale wrote me a letter after I was accepted, being like, what happened to your grades, man? And I was like, <laughs> ah, I'm drawing fan art. Um, <laughs> 
But I remember in high school, I was drawing Star Trek fan art like every single day after school. Like I think after I took the AP uh, microeconomics exam, I was like, I don't want to learn macroeconomics. I've learned the micro. That's enough. This is Star <laughs> Star Wars, Star Trek time. May I ask what you got on your AP exam? For the macro, I think I got a four. Wow. And for micro, I definitely got a two. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. Okay. Yeah, I do. But it's okay. I got fives and other stuff. Okay. But when I, when I was, I was just drawing every day and to this day, there are people who have purchased my book in bookstores who are like, I remember your Star Trek fan art. So yeah, even From when you were like in middle school oh, and high school. Yeah. So wow. even though I got a two on that exam, like it was a long-term <laughs> investment. It worked out. <laughs> so that's how I found my audience. Like just slowly over time, putting mm. my work out there and people like Reson like some humor resonating mm. with it, some weirdness, some quirkiness mm. resonating with them. And they, they, they somehow thankfully followed me up until this point. Can we, can we go down a little avenue? You talked, you mentioned how I almost got kicked out of Yale. And well, yeah. that before no, we get I, to no, that, no, I'm just kidding. I no, didn't no, 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 no. They, it was just, no, they're just kind of trying to scare me. Right. It's bit. like, girl, you need to get these grades up. Yeah. Yeah. We got that. So, but you talked about the things that you were consuming as a young as a kid that were, that was, I guess, inspiring you, right. To draw your own work. Yeah. What I know Star Trek was one and it, you talked about some animes. I mean, I'm curious to know what those were. Yeah. My, the, my favorite podcast is called like Las Culturistas. Mm -hmm. And this is usually the part of the podcast where they ask, so what would you say was the culture that made you say culture is for you? <laughs> okay. Oh, that is my question to you. What is the culture that made you say culture? It started story? off with anime like in 2003. I mean, honestly, it probably was closer to like when Pokemon dropped in 1997 nice. or 1998. Pokemon dropped. Yeah, you know, nice. when, when the Pokemon <laughs> dropped, uh, you know, it hit. Uh, yeah. Yeah, when that hit, I was just like, whoa, this is like, car these are cartoons I really want to watch. Mm -hmm. Like, and then there's games that go along with it. Mm -hmm. And then in middle school, a fantastic TV show called Yu-Gi-Oh came out. Yeah. And I was just, I was so thrilled by that. I don't know what, what got me just hooked. And that was when I started going online. I was like, there's gotta be other kids in America who are uh, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs about this, <laughs> about Yu-Gi-Oh. About Yu -Oh. <laughs> right. And there were even some, like literally I was uh, on the, my, like my kind of colleague SCAD grad work chat with um, one of my friends, Gail, uh, Gail Galligan, who is a New York Times bestselling, multiple times over, New York Times bestselling um, uh, graphic novelist who works with Scholastic. And they also were into Yu-Gi-Oh! a oh, lot. Nice. Um, so it's, it was kind of crazy. We were all very into those things. Star Trek was a big one. Um, I read a lot of PG Woodhouse books growing up. Right, we're gonna uh, we're gonna insert shots of uh, PG Woodhouse. All the all these covers yeah. that uh, I got a random person to make for uh, make for me. Nice. Uh, and yeah, The Simpsons as well. Of the course, Simpsons, yeah. This was a huge influence. Yeah. And I really enjoyed kind of a, like light hearted but meaningful humor. Nice. So all of that kind of mixed together and influence the type of art that I wanted to make like mm -hmm. fun, a little like exciting, actiony, um, found family, sitcom, yeah. sci-fi. Okay. So let's talk about check please. Yeah. Because I, I remember when that was starting up, uh, your first kick Kickstarter with which like funded within an hour. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, let's, t let's talk about that. Yeah. And there was a, there was like a buildup for that. Cause I remember when that Kickstarter was funded, it was, that was kind of when people started being like, oh, what is this weird web comic? Mm -hmm. But before that, I had launched the comic in 2013, the summer after I graduated from college, and I was just working on it. I, at one point, I was working on it like when you were in grad school. I think I was at your apartment just like drawing the comic over the summer. Uh, I worked on it all through grad school. My professors were kind enough to let me turn in sometimes, check please, as an assignment. And I took a class at the beginning of my second year of grad school called, what was it called? Let's just say, I think it was, oh, it was a self-promotion class. It was a self-promotion <laughs> okay. class. So I was like, I'm going to do a Kickstarter. I don't know why I had the idea to launch like a career defining or career ending Kickstarter <laughs> for my self-promotion class. So I was able to turn in my turning in assignments or deliverables for that class was all of my plans for my Kickstarter, mm -hmm. my budget. 
And I remember the day before I was going to launch, because I was going to launch it in class because I was like high stakes, right? Mm -hmm. I want to be humiliated in front of my classmates. Wow. I was so nervous because, I mean, I had taken out loans for grad school. If I, I didn't have anything else to fall back on if this Kickstarter did well, then I would get to work on Check, Please potentially full time. And if it didn't do well, you know, I wouldn't be destroyed, but... I would probably have to take like get another job or do something else to to fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. And I was so nervous the day, like 24 hours before my Kickstarter launched. I was in Savannah, Georgia at the Savannah College of Art and Design. I walked downtown all the way to the river and I just like stared at the water, trying to will this calm into myself of like, this river is so large. This, I'm so small. None of this matters. But I was still so nervous that I still had to yeah. like take a shot of whiskey to go to bed. Anyway, wow. don't <laughs> don't use guys um, or use responsibly. <laughs> Sorry, or don't, or don't. I look, I look straight into the camera. <laughs> don't. So, like, yeah. Spoiler alert. I launched a Kickstarter in class and it was funded in class, which thank goodness my classmates wow. were like, oh, good for, good for you. <laughs> yeah, seriously. You know, they weren't, they weren't going to like kind of mourn me there. And that's how it all started. That first Kickstarter mm -hmm. raised about like 10 or 12 times the amount that we like were initially going for. I had mm -hmm. to figure out how to fund, like how to fulfill it myself, ordering books from China, wow. sending, them, sending them to a warehouse, yeah. talking with backers. The second Kickstarter was kind of the real big one. Mm -hmm. That was when I think we were going for like 25,000. I'm totally forgetting numbers. And we raised over a quarter million. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it, it was, it was wild. That yeah. was the point where I was like, oh, I can be a comic book artist. Right. Potentially for the rest of my life. And yeah, since then each Kickstarter has been, you know, pr pretty successful. And yeah, that self-publishing is something I'm still very passionate about. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily always want to do giant Kickstarters. I'm, my dream is to do like a lot smaller self-publishing, which is more intimate and fun. That is how I even got started in grad school. I was just self-publishing mm -hmm. these tiny zines and I got addicted to it. But check please, going from being a comic that people read on Tumblr to being something that's self-published that people own to being something that like someone born in like 2004 can pick up at their high school like library. library. It's, it's, it's been a big journey over these 10 years. That, okay, so there, there's a lot to kind of unpack with that. The first thing I want to talk about is the crowd crowdfunding and mm -hmm. just being able to essentially fund your, you know, your work. And then moving on from that, now that you have a, you know, you're working with a publisher. Yes. Okay, so are, are you finding yourself, like before, you're able to just be completely free. You had you're able to control your content. You're able to do whatever you want in that, in that arena. Now, can we talk about that from there to now where you're working with the publisher, are they still allowing you that freedom? Do you still feel like you're in a space where you could be creatively just kind of explore and do what you need to do and do what you want to do? Yeah. yeah. So surprisingly, I've not run into any creative roadblocks in comics, even though I'm working with the publisher. I think publishers are looking for people who have different voices. They're looking for people who are willing to take some risks. I mean, if there's any feedback that they might give, it usually is just to make the product better. Um, and it, it's, it's not so different from, I mean, maybe the biggest difference between crowdfunding and publishing right now is that I can't immediately share my pages online. That's probably the biggest difference. But in terms of just the actual content, of the projects. It's all, it's all good. Are you still doing anything with check please? I know that project kind of ended. Yeah. Or, or there, is there anything you could talk about? You're willing to talk about with regard to uh, check please? At this time, <laughs> there's nothing the I can talk of about. this recording. Okay. I, yeah. There's not really anything I can talk about. Yeah. And it, it was great to publish the comic and the Kickstarters mm -hmm. and then have first second, which is an imprint of Macmillan publish the book. But, at this time, we're just trying to fulfill the very last Kickstarter. Cool. Can you talk about some other projects that you're into outside of... Um... Yes. Yeah. So uh, over the next two years, in 2024 and 2025, I should have three books out. I'll go in order of release. 
So the first book should be, it's a book called Bunt. Mm. And it is the story of softball. Oh, sorry, softball students. I already loved it. <laughs> it's the story of art students who have to win one game of softball in order to get athletic scholarships. No way. Yeah, it's, it was born, uh, it, I'm, I'm writing the story and my friend Madeline is drawing it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, her art is amazing. Her art's right here, actually. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Madeline Rupert of Sakana fame. Yeah, the story was born of us. We were, we had just finished graduating from like SCAD and we had a lot of thoughts on the relationship between financial aid, creativity, and what you actually get out of art school. Ooh. Plus I had just written a uh, graphic novel entirely of sports. Madeline played travel softball for 10 years. We figured we can create basically basically create a heist story, a heist movie mm -hmm. uh, about how these students were going to trick their school into paying for their education. So, Bunt comes out early twenty twenty four. We're working on the cover of it right now, but it is it's it's a fun book. I think art students especially are going to be like, oh, they're going to do that Leonardo DiCaprio meme. <laughs> yeah. Um, then the second book I'm working on, which should come out the summer of 2024, is called Barda and is with DC Comics, which, again, that kid who was drawing fan art instead of doing microeconomics homework was drawing DC Comics fan art. <laughs> so awesome. take that, Mr. Mac. No, yeah, he, was, he, was, he was a great guy. Can, can, okay, yeah. so is this your first project with DC? It's, technically, it's my second. Mm -hmm. I drew like three pages mm -hmm. for this Harley Quinn anthology, oh, okay. and that's kind of how I segued into this job. Okay, cool. I'm really thankful that I got that because that's basically yeah. 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 Um, and Barda, I always I I'll try not to wax too poetic about mm -hmm. Barda because once I talk about Jack Kirby properties, I I do reveal that you're, I'm a cult member of the cult of King Kirby. You're very passionate. I become. Very passionate. Yes. But long story short is uh, Jack Kirby. He's the guy who invented Captain America. He like it, he did Thor. He was the one who originally designed Iron Man. Uh, when he left Marvel to work at DC, he created this thing called the fourth world, which is this huge cosmic story of like good and evil. And one of the characters he created was a character named Barda. And she lives on this evil dystopian planet. And as a young girl, she basically falls in love with um, a dissenter, a freedom fighter, and I'm telling her story. Mm. And I'm really excited about that. Had, had you been familiar with Barda and Jack Kirby and all that stuff prior? To yeah, 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 like, yeah. It, like Jack Kirby is so is so well known. Mm -hmm. Barda, I had known her from the cartoons I watched growing up, mm -hmm. but I was so one of my one of the things I'm really thankful for it was the chance to dive in super deep. Mm -hmm to uh, Kirby lore, like read interviews by him, autobiographies, and yeah, and then just study all of his early comics. So that's the second project, okay. very excited. Mm -hmm. And the last project is with First Second, which is the same publisher who prints Check Please, right. and it's called Flip, mm -hmm. and it's the story of a poor scholarship student at a private high school in Texas who switches bodies with her crush. Wow. And it's like Freaky Friday meets Get Out. <laughs> That's how I've been peach pitching it because it's about socioeconomics. That. It's about race. Mm -hmm. It's a, like a little bit of like Toni Morrison's bluest eye because mm -hmm. uh, Chi Chi is this like super dorky kid in Houston, Texas, who has crush, who has a crush on like this really popular white boy. And she asks him out to the dance and he says no. Mm -hmm. And then the next day she wakes up she is in his body and he is in hers. And they spend the entire graphic novel trying to get back to their, to their respective bodies. Um, this story, it, it, it sprouted out, it sprouted out from so many things, but there are a lot of scenes in the story that I'm, ex that I'm excited for people to see, like the scene where uh, Chi Chi has to braid her own hair, but she is in a white boy's body and it just, <laughs> and they're watching a Nollywood movie. Oh, I, just love the automatic just yeah, scenarios that it's just creates. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's other scenes where, oh my gosh, like they're, she's driving like Flip, who is the, is the eponymous character. Mm -hmm. uh, he is driving Chi Chi home and they, they keep switching back and forth. They keep flipping. Mm -hmm. So she ends up in his body 
while she's driving, while he's driving and she doesn't know how to drive. So they're like on I-45 or something and she's just <laughs> screaming. She's like, ah, I don't know how to drive. And just like a lot of shenanigans and a lot of, uh, a lot of crying and good old teenage emotional stuff. That is so cool. Okay. So you are a, you, you call yourself a cartoonist yeah. or a comic book artist or, or yeah. whatever. But I've also heard that you heard from you that you maybe even prioritize the storytelling aspect of yeah. it, which is, you know, goes back to Bunt and how you, you, you just, just a wrote, writer. Yeah, you're yeah. just the writer on yeah. that. So which of those two, I guess, parts that we were just divided and in, cleanly into two even parts, which of those two do you kind of like, if you had to choose one, let's ask that question. Oh, it'd be, it'd be writing. Like easy? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I love drawing. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's something that I've always done. Mm -hmm. um, but storytelling is something that, uh, if anything, I learned how to draw to service my storytelling. Interesting. I, I think I was always a very slow writer growing up. Mm -hmm. And so I was just like, if I draw it, that's faster. <laughs> and, and that's what ended up happening. Mm -hmm. I, and I, like, I do love art. I love drawing a character's expression. Mm -hmm. I, love, I love coloring. That's one of my favorite things. Mm -hmm. um, I've taught classes on coloring. But it's, I, I do think that at the end of the day, you know, and not to, not to sell myself too short, but at the end of the day, what really brings people in and makes them stay with my work mm. is the writing and the humor. That's interesting. So like the storytelling, not necessarily like the words, craftsmanship, although I know that is super important to you, but like maybe the world building and yeah. just creating an experience yeah, creating the narrative. Creating characters, yeah. like finding an interesting narrative, finding mm. an interesting narrative question mm -hmm. that readers, like once they discover that question, they're like, well... How are we going to answer this? That's, great. that's that's really where I'm like, that's why people are coming to the show, I guess. Speaking of coming to the show, um, you you people have asked you like invited you to come out for residencies at different schools and things like that. And this speaks to the work that Tyler and I are, are doing, uncovering possibilities within and around academia. So can you talk about your residencies and places you've been to, people people you've worked with? And I, I mean, from what we've talked about, it seems you really enjoy those experiences. Yeah, I love, yeah. It. I love yeah. it. Yeah, I've been I've been asked to do workshops. Um, I've been asked to teach master classes. I have done a few keynotes, which is which have been really fun. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important part uh, it's it's part of my professional practice to engage with students just to see what they're up to, mm -hmm. what is the of the trends in the market. And it's it's been really fun. So I think my two most memorable moments have been, I did a keynote at New York Comic Con in 2019, mm -hmm. so right before the pandemic. And that was for librarians and educators. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really fun just to tell them the story of Check Please, tell them my background, why I'm making Check Please, and why these stories are very important. Mm -hmm. um, and then recently, in October of last year, I went to Denmark to the Viborg, or Viborg Animation Festival to teach uh, two master classes on storytelling and self-publishing to mm -hmm. the students at the animation workshop in Viborg. And that was great. Just I, I had, that was my first time interacting with students who weren't from the United States or Canada, and I, and I learned a lot. That's okay. So. It's, it's interesting you call it your, part of your professional practice. I mean, yes. whatever is one's professional practice is their own decisions yes. prim primarily. So why have you decided that teaching and working with students who are, you know, in the formative years of their career, why, why have you decided to make that a part of your own professional practice? That's true. Oh my God. And I forgot, and I will answer that question. I sure. forgot to mention probably one of the most formative things I've done, which was a year long mentorship with the students at the Savannah right. College of Art and Design. And you still have kind of like informal mentors. Yeah. I, I with... talked to them. Yeah. Frequently. Yeah, yeah. And that was something where I did teach a class. I did. I taught a few classes and did a few talks mm -hmm. on campus for uh, about two or three days in 2019. 19 and then I kept track of and like had talks with uh, the students over the course of 2019 and into the pandemic mm -hmm. uh, that was really fun and I do like some of them have book deals now some of them are like totally blowing up on TikTok and I love keeping uh, keeping track of that and just like getting on the phone or talking with them to see how they're doing um, 
why is that part of my professional practice? I prioritize it because I mean, not only do I just get fulfillment from it, I learn a lot. Mm -hmm. what, uh, there was a SCAD student who sent me a book about like fear and art, and it's something that I read. Mm -hmm. Like that was, and I was like, oh wow, that like the, the students. It's almost trite to say, but students teach you as much as you oh, teach 100%. them. So, do you I, do you know the name of that book? I don't know the exact okay, we'll name of that book. We'll figure it out. Yeah. What advice do you have for people who are looking to make to make intrigue. comics yeah it's really just to start the biggest just to start the biggest uh hurdle that i see with people who i mean want to do any project mm -hmm. but particularly in comics is they want to be ready to make their first epic comic mm -hmm. they 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 really want to have all the skills down and they want to know everything so it's perfect whereas the truth is when you make when you're making comics you truly just have to start your first comic's not going to be great mm -hmm. it's going to be meaningful and mm -hmm. it's people are going to be interested in it and you're going to learn a lot mm -hmm. but it's not going to be the amazing comic that you have in your mind right. it's it's just starting and then kind of learning as you go and that's truly my best advice there's just just just, just get into it yeah just jump into it kind of just and even even to the point of releasing your stuff and letting other people oh yeah it. i mean because that's what people like one of the most famous comics and anime right now is called one punch man mm -hmm. um and also mob psycho created by the created by the same creator mm -hmm. and if you saw the comics that were originally published for like one punch man they look like a little juvenile they're right. not very they're really not polished but this creator had such a vision and they wanted to share the story and mm -hmm. people were like we love this story we want more of it and now mm -hmm. there's like a yeah. huge series about it i am I, I, the, the the perfectionism or trying to like realize a perfect vision is really the death of a lot of like what could be amazing narrative ideas so people are that's my biggest advice if you can slay that dragon and just get your art out there mm. that's that's maybe 80 percent of it that is a punch in the arm i think so many of us need including myself and and you know on, on the daily that we're so worried about you know the type of feedback we get we want it to be just right that it prevents us from doing the actual work that we need to do to yeah. just get it out there get it done um and slaying that dragon so can i ask you about like what things you do personally to slay that dragon so to speak to slay, slay. slay the <laughs> slay um i i try to lower my expectations to subterranean levels mm. like I, I every single project that i have done i know firmly that it is not the best thing in the world or it's not the best thing that i can do or the best thing that i will do mm. it is even for my comic like my, my comic with dc like i've been drawing these characters since i was like 14. Mm. Uh, again that's why i got two uh, in my, my graphic <laughs> but if in my head i was like okay well i've had this dream since i was a kid i have to make these comics the best ever I would still be redrawing the first page. I remember when I drew mm. the first page of my comic of my comic with DC, I was very disappointed. It did mm. not look great. And I, I do sound like I am being too hard on myself, but in the reality is A, it's not that bad. And B, whatever student or young person who picks it up, they're gonna think it's they're gonna love it. They're gonna mm. think it's it's fine. So I really just have to, you just kind of have to, for myself, I, I, I just kind of march on, just allowing myself to have different goals. Like this page is not going to be the best page I draw, but you know, let me see if I could at least get this, this arm, right? Let me see if, let me really focus on the costume that the superhero is wearing. Um, like, oh, these colors, they did not turn out exactly the way I wanted. And this scene isn't as beautiful and like moody and dramatic as I envisioned, but let me just see if I can really focus on an aspect of coloring here. Just kind of tempering my expectations so that the entire world- <laughs> The weight of expectation, you don't crumble. Yeah, you don't crumble. You, you're, your not, you're not constantly trying to achieve genius or like, mm. this is my legacy. It's, it's just, <laughs> I mean, and also for me, it's just cartoons. There you go. It's not that big of a deal. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, that's how I do it.
that's cool. That's Saying cool. it's just comics is a huge way to just be like, hey, how many times have I said it's just band? Yeah. yeah. It's the same thing. It's just, it's just, we're just making music here. Yeah. It's not, you know, saving lives. Um, so can, can we move on to maybe some things that you're interested outside of what you do for your profession? Like things, hobbies, interests, and and such. I don't really have any. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> um, hobbies, interests, and such. Uh, well, I mean, the most, like, prevalent one is that I do a lot of stand-up and improv, mm -hmm. which is something that I've been doing since like, college. Um, and that's, uh, improv is something that, it's it's a silly thing and it's fun, but it is something that teaches you just to just do it. Like, mm -hmm. there you don't think, just do. Mm -hmm. And stand-up is something that teaches you, uh, hey, you are going to fail, and you are going to fail really hard right. quite often, but just pick yourself up again. Right. So those are kind of the two lessons I get from those uh, those experiences. But, I mean, I also like to run, yeah. which has been fun. This is like a very social thing. I don't do it too seriously. But that's, I think running also has helped me in comics because it kind of teaches you that any long distance is achievable as long as you break it down into measurable bites. So finishing a 300 page graphic novel, yes, it will take you maybe two years, but if you just do a page a day, hey, you'll be fine. Yeah. And that's what comics, that's really what running is. That's, that's really great. So, I mean, I know those, you talked about how all those things inform your, your work. I mean, is there anything you do that is just completely kind of exclusive from that? I think, I mean, I play a lot of video games. Mm -hmm. One game that I like talk about a lot is a game called Brogue, which is not a, People don't know about this game because it's like a very strange uh, dungeon crawler roguelike that is online. I play that game for hours a week, <laughs> and that does not, it just if it, if that doesn't not only does that not help my comics, it's why I probably don't get as much done. <laughs> it, it directly detracts from my productivity. But the 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 concept of brogue, and I also can speak very passionately about it. Yes, go ahead, please. Is that uh, with a roguelike, there are certain things that make things like make a certain game a roguelike. It's like it's like a top-down ASCII, like right. little letters moving around, and that's the graphic interface. But other elements that make a game a roguelike is things like permadeath, um, like like oh, which is when you die, you restart the whole game. I hope you zoom in on my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <'cause>, uh... Permadeath. <laughs> uh, you have like inventory, like limited inventory that you try to figure out, and uh, you're fighting monsters. The big lesson that I've gotten from this game is usually when I play like an RPG, I love to hoard like all my potions so that like <laughs> when I fight the monster, I'm just like drinking my potions. But you can't do that in a game like this. You have to use everything at your disposal right at that moment. And it kind of translates to life. So you make everything connect to life. I mean, well, I think about things a <laughs> yeah, lot. Okay, and yeah, in, my, in my head, I'm like, yeah. you know what? Maybe I should start treating life like this. I can't just hold on to things and always mm. savor things. And sometimes in my head, I just do, I just say like, F it, let me just use this thing now because I don't know if I'm going to experience permadeath. Uh, you like, I, I can imagine you thinking that exact thing. I might experience I don't know if I turn the corner and there's a goblin that stabs me. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay, so where can we find you? Where, where can we find your work? Yeah, where can you find me? It's mm -hmm. a great question. Yep. Uh, check please the online comic has been online since its inception <laughs> and you can find that if you just google check please honestly if you google hockey comic i do think it pops up oh yeah it's at checkpleasecomic.com i'm online at i think i'm in gozi u n g o z i u at pretty much every social media site except for tiktok because there's this woman in nigeria who won't give me that <laughs> I am shaking my fist at her, <laughs> and I keep trying to message her. And she, I don't know. I don't know what Does she, she post at all? No, she doesn't. She's uh, she's she's waiting for you to pay her. She probably wants you to pay her for the name. I'm not. Yeah, you shouldn't. Uh, right, and continue. and yeah, you can find my books in bookstores and on the shelves in libraries. <laughs> <laughs> on the shelves in libraries. On the not, shelves not in a libraries. Bed, and beyond. Gotcha. Yeah. So that's where you can find me. Well, Anne, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. And thank you for watching another episode of Uncovering Possibilities. We have more stuff coming up for you soon. So take care.